I'm Batman. Well, I hardly think so. The real Cape Crusader calls his crime-biting cohorts when he's running late. I had to walk. I couldn't get Raj on the back of my scooter. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Aquaman sucks. Good evening, everybody. Welcome into the Geek End. And we are actually doing part two of a series that we started last week. What we have been doing is the top 10 Marvel movies of all time. So any movies that were made out of a Marvel franchise, as long as they're live action, they are eligible. So this includes things that are even outside the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we're going to be concluding this list tonight. We have Scott, Justin, and Andrew, so let's get to it right now. This is the top four, the last part, part two, of the top ten Marvel movies list. Here we go. Number four. All right, number four on this list, one that I really, really appreciate. I actually had it a little bit higher on my list, but that's fine. The original Spider-Man. Just Spider-Man, no numbers, no subtitles, Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. That is our number four. I know that he's been rebooted an awful lot, so we have to clarify, but that's the one that we're discussing here. As I mentioned before we started filming, I couldn't even remember the uh, villains in these movies. I, I guess if you had asked me about this before the Tom Holland ones came out, then I'd be like, yeah, this would definitely be up there. But I don't know. I'm just not a huge fan of them. Any of those old Toby, what was it? Toby Maguire. Toby Maguire, yeah. And I, I'm not a huge fan of them. Like his girlfriend was cute, but <laughs> Tom Holland just makes, he cracks. Like, I, I guess I just went into him because the Tom Holland ones kind of overshadow them and my love for them. So it's hard for me to really find a lot of good to say about it. I guess in the time, you know, when the movie came out, it was pretty cool. The Green Goblin was, you know, pretty gnarly, but um, I just, I don't know. I didn't have much. Tom Holland cracks me up, but Tobey Maguire just makes it go, eh. I love how Andrew's takeaway from the Superman movie is, uh, uh, I don't know, Kirsten Dunst is hot. <laughs> I, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. It didn't I mean, make me laugh. It's honest. I, all right. Uh, <laughs> It had action and action and action and a little bit of downtime and action. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it did have action. And also, um, it kind of kicked off. This, uh, was there a popular superhero movie before Spider-Man? Save for the many, many Batman and Superman movies. But like X-Men this won. movement... X-Men 1 did... Was that before Spider-Man? It was. The first X-Men was before Spider-Man, if I'm not mistaken. So it it was kind of popular, but it's safe to say that the original Spider-Man really kicked off the superhero as a viable genre because X-Men 1 just did okay in the box office. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Spider-Man 1 uh, was at least dominated for an Oscar, I believe. I can't remember if it won one or not. But anyway... It's really interesting what you see happening with Peter. He's not meant to be funny. It's like that's not his shtick as a character. His shtick is that he's a loser, you know? Like <laughs> he's the loser nerd that's getting picked on and then he happens to have these superpowers and he does what any loser nerd teenager in high school would probably do with it. He tries to use them for self gain. Basically, he turns into a Tony Stark, pre-Iron Man to some degree, um, and completely blows off, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, um, which I don't think he even fully grasped what that meant within Spider-Man 1, but he kind of starts to grapple with it later on. But, I mean, the first thing he does, he's like, wow, I've got superpowers. I bet you I could win some cage fights really easy and get a car. And, you know, I don't want to go too much into it because a lot of what makes Spider-Man 1 good is how it comes into fruition in the much better Spider-Man 2, I think. So, you know, he was indirectly 
the cause of his uncle's death, who just warned him, you know, you got this re response. He obviously didn't know he had the powers, but gave him this nugget of wisdom with great power comes great responsibility. And then he's upset that, you know, he gets gypped out of his winnings from the cage match. And then basically him being spiteful, he's like, oh, you got robbed. Oh, that sucks for you. I'm not going to do anything, even though I totally could. And that comes back to bite him. You know, it's not necessarily him being vengeful, but it kind of is through inaction, him being vengeful. And that immediately comes back to bite him because his uncle dies, like his father figure dies because of that. And uh, the final scene with Norman Osborn was really good, too. The the pleading for forgiveness and whatnot, and then trying to kill Spider-Man and inadvertently killing himself. It really set up Spider-Man 2 very well. The thing that you kind of highlighted that I think is the essence of Spider-Man, both as a character in the movies and in the comics, is that really up until that point in the 1960s when Spider-Man first came out, every comic book hero was hero first, regular person second. And Stan Lee flipped that formula on its head. You're not reading about a superhero who also happens to have an alter ego. You're reading about a person named Peter Parker who also happens to be a superhero. And I think that that's really where this particular Spider-Man movie shines, is it emphasizes, look, this is just a nerdy kid from Queens. And he just happens to get, by a weird quirk of fate, bitten by a spider and get spider powers. And this is what a real person would probably do if they just woke up all of a sudden and, and realized that they had all these amazing abilities. They'd first be afraid and confused and not know what to do with it. And then once they started to learn a little bit about it, they'd probably try to use it to, to get, make some kind of gain or something like that. And the thing that makes Peter Parker's character so strong in this and, and in other mediums that he's featured in is that he doesn't give up. That even though he's got the world crashing down around him, he still keeps going. And that's really emphasized in all of the Spider-Man movies to a certain extent. But I think that this one may be the best example of it because it's it sets into motion a spiraling cascade of events that don't work out for him. I mean, finding out that his arch nemesis is his best friend's father who has been pretty good to him over the years and is the, the reason that he has, uh, you know, uh, the reason that he has his apartment, the reason that he has his best friend, all of those things and having to grapple with that and, and having these close interpersonal relationships with his own supervillains. I think that that really sort of set the stage and set the model for it. And, uh, as much as you can, I, I just can't say enough good about this movie. I guess is the best way to say it. Scott, I think, what we... uh, on you, you saying, um, that all the other superheroes so far were heroes first and then people, I think Stan Lee said something along the lines of about Spider-Man, other superheroes like Batman will wear a mask to strike fear into his enemies. Spider-Man wears a mask to hide his fear from his enemies. I had actually not heard that quote before, but that's actually yeah. an excellent way to put it. Scott, what were your thoughts on this one? Uh, it's a bad movie. I didn't like it when it came out. Uh, <laughs> I think I think uh, Tobey Maguire is, is not a good casting for Spider Man. Um, like I, I I thought I thought the Green Goblin was a good villain. I thought it was played well by William Dafoe. Um, but yeah, he was oh. yeah. Oh. <laughs> he was definitely the no, there. He's the Daredevil <laughs> <laughs> uh, One other thing, um, Blade was actually the first, like outside of the the terrible uh, Captain America from the nineties. And yeah, uh, I don't Daredevil. even know that those count. Yeah, yeah. Daredevil was like two thousand three. But, it, but, you know, like when you're pointing out X-Men and Spider-Man, those were, I mean, those are number one and number two, respectively, in the comic book universe as far as sales go. So those were the sure. safest picks. Um, but I just, I felt like they, honestly, they tanked on both. And I felt like just, at least the casting in X-Men was better, in my opinion. I just told me why it was a bad one. Like, Spider-Man. Why? Is a, 
he, he's a witty teenager that is not super popular, but he's smart. And like Tobey Maguire was just this shy kid that I, I don't know. Well, Peter he, Parker he in the kid. comics is shy though. He's he's shy, but he's funny, and he's but not as Peter Parker. He is funny uh, as Spider Man, and I I think it's a fair criticism to say that Spider Man doesn't do a lot of one liners like he does in the comics. But Peter right. Parker, when the mask is off, is not a particularly witty person. He's very unassuming. I mean, I, I've only read recent Peter Parker, which so kind of different, especially now that everyone knows who he is. But like, uh, okay, that that the, <laughs> you know, I don't know which ones yeah. you've read, so. Uh, I started at 700, so pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty far into the story, <laughs> some would say. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's fair. I, I don't know. I like, I haven't watched the movie in you know probably 15 years, and the main thing that I remember is Tobey Maguire crying, which just I don't know, man. It just seems weird. Like it, I just didn't think it was a great casting. Tom Holland's a great casting. Oh. Okay, well. Personally, I, I have to disagree with that. I think that I will say that Tobey Maguire doesn't look the part. Yeah. He's he's too tall to be Spider-Man. I'll give you that one. Tom Holland does look more like Peter Parker than Tobey Maguire does. But overall, I got to say the thing that I love about the Sam Raimi, the director of, of Spider-Man, the thing I love about the Sam Raimi trilogy and yeah, it goes off the rails in Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3 is a horrible movie. I, I get that. <laughs> but uh, the thing that I love about the Sam Raimi trilogy is that it does something that none of the other Spider-Man movies do. And as much as I like Tom Holland, granted, I don't much care for the the Andrew Garfield too. But as much as I like Tom Holland, one thing that it does is it goes and it takes Spider-Man basically in his ultimate Spider-Man form. And by that, I mean from the ultimate comics, from the very beginning, Spider-Man is dialed in with uh, Tony Stark and the Fantastic Four and the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., a lot of his technology is actually built by them, not by him and, and him just being a nerdy kid coming up with his own web shooters and his, his own tech, which in the comics he all comes up with on his own. And Tony Stark even comments at one point that if Peter Parker hadn't been bitten by a spider, he'd probably be a millionaire by now because he'd be just as rich, if not richer, than I am because of how smart he is. And the, what's great about the Raimi trilogy is it zeroes in on that. Like, what it really takes a look at is Spider-Man is on his own, and he's a self-made man. And Tom Holland, the thing that I don't like about some of his movies, even though I do enjoy the movies and I enjoy Tom Holland's performance in them, is he almost feels way too much like Iron Man Jr. And he doesn't really feel like his own character in a lot of those scenes. In Tobey Maguire, you really get a feel for who Peter Parker is, and he captures the essence of what, in my mind makes a great Spider-Man movie, which is having a real moral dilemma and having to deal with and sort of juggle his real life and his personal life and the the Spider-Man side of him. And in Tom Holland, they, they don't really do a very good job of showing that in the Raimi trilogy. They really do. And one last thing that I'll say about this movie that I think it cannot be overstated enough, Willem Dafoe's performance is just fantastic. He did Smeagol before Smeagol was cool. I mean, that whole scene where he's going back and forth with himself in the mirror, uh, I really do think that Andy Serkis watched that, and that became his basis for his performance of Smeagol in Lord of the Rings because it's very, very similar. Uh, he's a great villain. He's very menacing. You can tell that he's psychotic, but you can also understand his motivation and why he's so frustrated. And in a lot of ways he only becomes the green goblin because he feels like his back is up against a wall and he starts out as a pretty, a pretty good guy and somebody that's kind of relatable before he goes off the deep end into psychosis. And you almost feel bad for him a little bit because at least part of that is the formula screwing with his brain. And so there's just so many moving parts to this film that I think make it a, a really, really great story. Number three. Number three is Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Fantastic film. It's very different and almost seems out of place in the overall Captain America. Because the funny thing about the three Captain America movies is that First Avenger is basically a superhero movie that's also a World War II film. And then Winter Soldier is completely different because it's like a Captain America movie that's also a political thriller 
you know, something more like Born Identity or uh, to a lesser degree, 007. And then Captain America 3 is just Avengers 2.5. So they're all very, very different movies, despite the fact they're technically all in a trilogy. Well, yeah, like you were saying, political. And I thought the Born series was a good analogy because, yeah, in the first, and it kind of, in a way, mirrors our own, as Americans, view of our own country. Because, like, when we think of things from a perspective of what we were in World War II, um, it's like a full-on, we're obviously the good guys, and the Nazis are obviously the terrible guys. You know, we're the good guys fighting the good fight. And that's how Captain America saw it, too. He's Captain America. He's got sort of this naive, pure patriotism that in Winter Soldier just gets shattered because it's like his his own governance betraying him basically partially because it's infiltrated by foreign operatives but partially because government's kind of nasty you know uh right so... they they are infiltrated but the reason the infiltration works is because the system is corrupt exactly so he's he's got this this conflict going on where he wants to love america but America isn't being America. There is this abstract ideal that the reality is not meeting up with. And he has to wrestle with that fact. And then add on to that, that he has to wrestle the fact that he wants to love his best friend, but his best friend is his enemy in this situation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's complex layers going on. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, to, to th that that kind of an idea especially at that time was because you know n now it's not like it's unpopular or difficult to criticize america or the american government or anything like that but at that time it was sort of a strange position to take to be critical of the actions of the american government and uh they took it and made the protagonist captain america himself Right, I think that... Put him in that position that we as Americans were finding ourselves in. Right, and I think that that's the interesting part of that. It's not that that message was necessarily edgy or something that was new to movies. It's the fact that it was Captain America going through it that made mm -hmm. it edgy and new and something that you weren't expecting. I thought it was a great movie. Start to finish action. But no, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I get it. Like, Roger had a blade arm. That's cool. So that's really awesome. Totally. No, it was it was a movie that I wasn't expecting. I wasn't even expecting to like. Like I, I the Winter Soldier, it it never occurred to me who it was or that it was even part of the comic series. Because again, no comic background here. Mm -hmm. I don't know any of the backstories of these guys. And then to come into the movie and you see him and you kind of feel like you know who he, he like you're thinking it could be Bucky. I, you're not 100% sure most of the movie. And then when you finally find out, like your heart gets torn. Again, someone who has not seen, read the comics, doesn't know any of this. You see it for the first time and you're like, oh my goodness, what's he, what's he going to do? Like, this is his best friend who's on the enemy side and who is incredibly powerful by crazy means. But I don't know. It just, it was a really... It tugged at your heart a lot, especially the final scene uh, where there are in the final scenes where they're fighting and he takes off and he's like, I'm not going to I'm not going to fight you like he, he does. He goes to the absolute greatest lengths to make sure that he his friend knows that he's there with him to the end. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I remember him saying something like that. Like, I'm, I'm here with you until the end. But uh, man, it was it was a great movie. And I want to say that this is back when. Um, when we were watching agents of shield a lot mm -hmm. and there were so many correlations between a agents of shield and what happened between Avengers one and Avengers two. And to me, that was really, really cool. Or I'm sorry, Captain America winter soldier. Sorry. But like there, it was fun listening to how they linked things from agents of shield to the Marvel movies. And this one had a lot of stuff in it. And they mentioned the helicarriers and stuff like that. So 
overall, I mean, I, I can't find anything to hate about it. Yeah, that, that was one thing that was really cool. If you were watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that literally the week that it came out, the, the week that Captain America Winter Soldier came out was when all of the stuff happened in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and so they timed it perfectly to where the episodes that led up to it, and then if you went and saw opening weekend Winter Soldier, that the following episode that week was the fallout of what happened in Captain America Winter Soldier with Hydra being uh, in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. now. So... I never watched that show. Now I feel like I missed out. You really did. Like, it's a great series. I will say season one's not as good, but season two and beyond definitely is. Andrew brought up something that I'd really never thought about, which is how do you deal with that if you didn't know that Winter Soldier was Bucky? Because, like, I knew Winter Soldier was Bucky. I'd been reading Captain America comics my whole life. So I already knew who the character was. But if you just learned that and saw Chris Evans' expression, like when he learns, oh, that's Bucky. Like, this is my friend who I thought has been dead for decades now. And it turns out not only is he alive, but he's the enemy. Like, that had to be something that was really surprising. And that may be one, one way that actually comic book fans lost out a little bit in not having that experience. Uh, like, people who hadn't read the comics or weren't familiar with the characters probably got out of the movie uh, if you just didn't have that background in it. I, I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was a good movie. I, it's weird. Okay, so you guys are talking about Bucky. My main takeaway from when, when I was watching this was like, that's not Bucky. That doesn't at all look like him. Is it a different <laughs> character? You know, and like, like I, I knew it was Bucky going into the movie um, just because I, I kept up with it. But, like, I don't know. I was convinced that they had a different character. But, it, I mean, it was good. I, I guess I need to rewatch it. Um, I don't think I got super into it, clearly, like you guys did. So, I'll have to add that to my rewatch list. An honest answer. I, yeah. I, re I really liked this film. I thought that the tension between Bucky and Cap it plays out really well. Chris Evans does a good job with that. The thing that I, and I, I kind of am playing off of what Justin was saying earlier, the thing that I find so interesting about this is I think that it somewhat mirrors what society as a whole was going through in the sense that America is not really living up to its ideals. And when you're taking that from the standpoint of a guy that literally wears America on the chest, on his chest, that's the symbol of who he is. That's what he's supposed to stand for. And to have him come out of this long coma in a time where everybody understood who the enemy was and the enemy was was from somewhere far off, and the demons were not in the walls, and we were all united and basically of one mind. And to come into this much more complicated, much more nuanced system to where the bad guys have essentially infiltrated, the, the same bad guys that were in World War II, Hydra, have now infiltrated America and infiltrated our system and taken some of our, our innovation and our brilliance and used it against us. I mean, Captain America didn't recognize his country anymore, and that's really the spirit of, of who Captain America is. If you're reading the comics, the thing that is a recurring theme in them is he's a man out of time. He's, he's an old World War II veteran that just happens to not look old. And he doesn't... He has a lot of old-timey, some might say outdated or naive ideals, but that's because he still sees America as this intangible object. He sees it as a set of ideals of truth and equality and uh, always vying for liberty. And so it's interesting. And I think one of the big takeaways from it is that you can continue to be a patriot. You can continue to love the ideals that the flag stands for without hating the flag itself. You can, you can still love what America was always intended to be without condoning every action that it takes. You can even stand against some of the actions that it takes and continue to be a patriot. And I think that that's a really, really strong message and one that frankly was sorely needed at the time when Captain America came out and is still relevant today. And it didn't matter, you know, it, it, then, even now, what side of the political spectrum you were on, right, right, everyone left, agreed. Whatever. Everyone agreed. Things were not quite right. Yeah, well, one of the big things that it hints at is the surveillance state and what was going on with the NSA. And that was 
that has been one issue that even though I, I think it probably should have united us a little bit more, that's one thing that a lot of people on the right in the week in the wake of 9-11 were saying, oh, no, well, you, if you've got nothing to hide, you don't have to worry about the government spying on you. Yeah, let them go through all of my papers and all of my records. And by the time that Winter Soldier came out, that position had really changed because a lot of people on the right didn't like the fact that the NSA was doing that under the direction of Barack Obama. And I don't yeah, mean to... funny that Patriot Act keeps getting renewed. Yeah. And <laughs> and I don't want to get like super deep into politics because the whole point of the geek end is that I don't do that. But <laughs> I think that it's really, really important that when you see something happening and you approve of it when it's your guy, and then all of a sudden your guy isn't in control of it, you see, oh, maybe that was a big deal, and maybe we should have been a little bit more cautious about that. And maybe we should be more skeptical of people that are in power, whether or not they have a DNR behind their name. And that was one thing that I think Captain America Winter Soldier really highlighted is we should all be in this together. We should all think like Americans and, and we should believe in principles like innocent until proving guilty or not trying to manipulate people into certain behaviors or uh, playing this game where we take out people that we think might do something wrong in the future this should all be things, basic principles that we agree on and can unite on. Number two. Number two on our list is Spider-Man 2. So, if nothing else, the number fits the ranking. So, <laughs> uh, This is another head-scratcher ranking for me. Um, this one, I feel like I'm pretty well-versed in because it's like, I think this came with the PSP that I got. And so, like, it was this was the only m movie that I had on my PSP. So I watched it, I don't know, a hundred times. And I, it was okay. I didn't love it. It's weird that this is on here and not Spider Man Into the Spider Verse, which is like a top 100 movie of all time, according to IMDb. What um, is that? That's the one that came out two years ago. It's the animated yeah. one with Miles. Yeah. Oh, I've seen it. It's okay. It's considered animated movies. I mean, it's. Yeah. Yeah, this was, was live action. We may do an animated one later though. Oh, uh, okay. My bad. I didn't know this was live action one. I'm just like I'm just like this It's not your fault, Scott. Movie. You relate to the party. That was on me. Uh, uh, but uh I don't know. I thought it was okay. I thought I thought Doc Ock as a, a right that was him, right? Mm -hmm. As a villain was good. Um but I just didn't love the Tobey Maguire thing, so like I said, a lot of Spider-Man 1's strengths was leading up to Spider-Man 2. And I don't think he realizes it early in the movie, but the whole with great power become becomes great responsibility um, theme it, overhanging him. It, it, it was really starting to show itself to be true. I don't think he realized it, but like he's constantly having to sacrifice his own personal life in order to be Spider-Man. He's sacrificing, you know, he got the girl, but things are on edge. He's always done well in school. Grades are slipping and just constantly things are going bad. Can't keep a job. Aunt May's not able to pay the rent and he can't help because he can't keep a job. All this because he's choosing to be Spider-Man. And he, you know, is not very happy about it and eventually chooses ah, i'm done with it i'm not going to do it anymore okay. that's it's kind of a it's a kind of, kind of a interesting because that's that's the complete wrong answer and he finally realizes that later and picks it back up is that when you're able to do something like that you you, you kind of have it's it's the freedom uh duty Di uh, not dichotomy, but like two sides of the same coin between rights and duties is Correlative. since you have, huh? Co correlation. That's what you're thinking. Correlation. Of. Yeah. So since you have these abilities, you're able to do these things and protect people in ways that other people can't. You have the responsibility to lay yourself down and do that. And it's a very good overarching theme when you're talking about the idea of what a hero is, and we actually had this discussion last week when we were talking about anti-heroes and, and heroes and whatnot, 
to me, the central theme of what makes a hero is, are they willing to sacrifice for the greater good? Are they willing to give up something of themselves in order to, uh, for something that they are not necessarily going to benefit from in return? And I think out of all the movies that we looked here, and we've talked about a lot of heroes over the span of this countdown, I think this movie epitomizes that more than any other, that Spider-Man says, you know what? It doesn't matter if I don't get the girl. It doesn't matter if it strains my relationship with my family. It doesn't matter if I'm constantly poor and I can't make my classes on time. I have been given a gift. I have to use it to help other people. And so, I mean, there's just not a better characterization of a hero than that, in my opinion. Andrew? And it's epitomized in the hero because that's, you know, that's what a hero is defined as. But, you know, even less, you know, to still a great degree, that's what it is to be a father. That's what it is to be a mother. That's what it is to be human, broadly speaking. Right. You, you do have to, every human being is faced with that choice eventually. Are you going to do the right thing or are you going to do what makes you happy? This one, I actually do remember now that you guys are talking about it more. And... I remember at the time that it came out, it came out at a time in my life where you could really like empathize with what Peter Parker was going through. Um, as a kid who's in high school, getting ready for college and stuff like that, you're, you have so many things going on in your life. And I mean, he's got a girl. But guess what? I'm pretty sure she was engaged to someone else, like his best friend or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but she was engaged to someone else in this movie. A, so like, a friend, uh, Jonah's a son. Friend. Yeah. And then like the conflict within him is, is incredible. As you guys have already mentioned, like the, his grades were slipping. He's like at his wits end with everything, family problems. And he just absolutely gives up on everything. And he's like, I just don't want to do it anymore. And the fact that he turns around and picks it up again, knowing that he has to, like, what person can't relate to that? Like, we've all probably had those moments in our lives where we just have everything going wrong, but we, you know, we have this calling in us. It's like, we've got to do this. We want to give up on it, but we can't, and we have to get back to it. I think that, that really speaks to who he is. And, and don't forget about um, his relationship with his friend, Harry. What not that his name? His best yeah, friend was yeah. Harry. Harry. Like, how much must it stink to know that you killed his father as Spider-Man and he hates Spider-Man, but you still want to be friends with him? Like that, that would drive me nuts. And I think that's something a lot of people don't look at is how difficult that would have been on anybody, uh, let alone, you know, Peter Parker. But you're having to go through and live almost a double life to keep that friendship alive, but you're also lying to him or being deceitful by not letting him know, Hey, I actually offed your dad. I'm sorry. He was a evil man. <laughs> like ah, I was, there's so much conflict and in, in, internal conflict in that movie. It's it almost. And being uh, haunted by being responsible for uncle Ben's death as well. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, just trying to hold everything together in this giant intricate web. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say though uh spirit uncle ben or dream uncle ben whatever because he has that one scene in spider-man 2 he's the only one that isn't happy with peter's decision which i thought was very appropriate yeah yeah but when it comes down to it i think the brilliance of this movie because it plays off of two major spider-man arcs in the comics and by the way a huge nod to some of the fans if you see the scene where Tobey Maguire is walking away from the spider suit with it in the trash can, if you look at the cover of Spider-Man number 50, it's almost an exact replica. I mean, it is exactly the same as that cover, and, and that's the storyline that it plays off of, Spider-Man No More. But the reason that I think the brilliance of that movie comes from is the in-between part. And this is a really weird thing to say for a Spider-Man movie or a superhero movie in general, because usually it's all a big build up to what happens at the end. But the middle part is what makes the entire movie work. Because I think where a lot of superhero movies and hero stories in general go wrong is they wind up with the hero gets to have it both ways. He gets to bear the burdens of a hero and he also gets to fulfill himself and gets to do what he wants. Spider-Man does the exact opposite. 
in fact, in the middle of that movie, it kind of proves, oh, all the crap in my life was because I'm Spider-Man. It wasn't just my imagination. It wasn't like one of those things where uh, it's almost a rip off of a wonderful life where it turns out me not having these super superpowers was worse for everybody. He, Peter Parker gets to experience what his life would be like if he didn't have Spider-Man. He's making all of Mary Jane's plays. He has a great relationship with his aunt. His relationship with his best friend, Harry, isn't strained anymore. Uh, he's making his classes. He's got a, you know, he's he's able to have his interpersonal relationships. He's not as poor as he used to be. He's got more time. Basically everything in his life is better. And yet at the end of the day, he sees that Spider-Man is still needed, that there are still people that depend on the other side of his personality, who he is on the other side of the mask and are relying on those powers to keep them safe. And once he realizes that, despite the fact that, yeah, his life is probably going to suck again. If he takes up the mantle of Spider-Man, he decides you know what? It's worth it because I have to, because I have this power. I have this gift. I've got to use it to help other people. That's what it's supposed to do. And so this is really a coming of age story. And that's what I love so much about it is that it really reflects where a lot of people were in their life. When, when this story took place is that the transition from being a child to being an adult is realizing it's not all about you then there are other people that rely on you. And, and ultimately that is a good thing, but it also means that there's going to be some things that you want to do that you can't do. And so that's really where Peter Parker is in his life right then. He's, you know, a, probably about a sophomore in college at this stage in his life. And so that really his journey as Peter Parker and Spider-Man sort of reflects where he was in his life. And it, it's something that really spoke to me uh, when I saw it. And it plays uh, it, what you were saying about not being able to have it both ways and that combination with it being a coming of age. In Spider-Man 1, he was under the impression that he could have it both ways. Mm -hmm. Even even like metaphorically in the situations that he was faced with on, on screen when like Green Goblin had in one hand a cart full of people and the other hand Mary Jane. Choose one. You can't save them both. And she then, winds and up saving them both. both. Yeah. But gradually, that becomes more and more impossible. Right. He realizes that being Spider-Man is going to come with sacrifices, and he mans up and says, you know what, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. That's what I love about this film. Honorable mention. Now, this was something that longtime fans of the show have probably realized that we've never done before, but we had to do it for this one, and I'll give you a quick backstory as to why. Our main honorable mention, and you guys can mention some other ones if you want to, Thor Ragnarok. So what we did was we tallied the scores just like we do every time. And in this one, it was so contentious. It was so tight between these movies because of how much good there is in the Marvel catalog. We actually had two ties. So Iron Man was tied with Avengers for the number five and six spot. And then Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor Ragnarok was tied for the nine and 10 spot. And we had a tiebreaker. And after the tiebreaker, we were still tied. So we had to bring in a second tiebreaker just to decide whether or not Thor Ragnarok or Guardians of the Galaxy was going to make the list with some of the other guys that you've seen on previous episodes of The Geek End. And finally, Thor Ragnarok wound up losing. But it's still a great film. It's very, very similar to the Guardians movies in a lot of ways. Really, really funny. Heavy emphasis on the humor. And I mean, come on, Jeff Goldblum and Chris Hemsworth on screen. That's going to be a good time no matter what you do. So <laughs> uh, I really on like Karth, the... I'm 40 years old, but on Earth, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> That's a pretty good summary of that movie, actually. Uh, but Guardians and Thor Ragnarok, very similar in a lot of ways. They both take place in space. They're a kooky space odyssey. I personally thought Thor Ragnarok was better, but I had no problem with Guardians being on the list. But great film, really funny. Gets to closest thing we'll ever have to a Planet Hulk live action movie. That's also probably true. I mean, that scene where Chris Hemsworth is looking up and he sees that it's Hulk that's his opponent. He goes, yes, that's one of the best scenes in the Marvel archive, in my opinion. My, the one I really want to hit on is Iron Man three. Uh, I think it gets a lot of hate. I just I love it. I think Shane Black is a great director. Uh, I watch it not every Christmas, but like pretty often for Christmas. I think just 
uh, I think you can sneak it in there. Um, like, yeah, you can you can hate on the the villain, but honestly, I feel like how they flipped it out um, was pretty good. I just enjoyed it. Um, I also really enjoyed Captain Marvel. Um, yeah, I just thought that was a really good movie. Um, Thor, I enjoyed a lot. It was very entertaining. I'm as far as villains and storyline goes, yeah, I don't think it was that great in regard that regard, but I think it made up for it so much with, you know, fun visuals and fight scenes. So the, the banter between Thor and Hulk, especially given their past relationship up until that point, it's always been kind of strained. Not so much between Bruce Banner and Thor, but between Hulk and Thor. Hulk done like Thor. Uh, <laughs> Hulk also um, really hates and Iron plus Man, it was too. really cool to see Thor using lightning without having to have Mjolnir um, that was cool but uh, yeah and as far as other honorable mentions I also had Iron Man 3 uh, Iron Man 3 is actually on my list as well um, again this goes back to my childhood of loving to see all of the suits that could do, you know, all these different things. And he actually was able to call them to him and make them do all these cool things. So that was pretty cool. And also uh, his girlfriend, fiance, whatever at the time, she's like a flaming ball of fire. That's pretty cool. Um, one of them uh, that I don't think we even had listed was uh, Civil War. Again, someone who comes from not knowing anything that's happening in the comics, going into these movies fresh, that movie was outstanding. Like seeing the conflict between uh, Captain America and Iron Man the whole way through, never knowing who's going to win. Like you just keep thinking, oh, he's got the upper hand. He's got the upper hand. And the, that was also the first time I saw Tom Holland in a uh, movie. His, uh, <laughs> all the witty things he says, like the comedy makes about, you guys ever see that one movie with the uh, Star Wars? and all that? Like that was hysterical. So Andrew was uh, a I fan really of that it. one because there's a Star Wars reference in it. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was great. <laughs> now, you know, Civil War gets a lot of hate and I think that it probably gets more hate than it deserves. But that's one difference between me and you because I really love the Civil War arc in the comics and that's probably one of the reasons I don't like the movie as much because I wanted it to be like the comics and it wasn't. Uh, the only honorable mentions I'd like to throw out there, I already mentioned one, X-Men 2, which I think is is a pretty good film. I really like, it's a much better Wolverine origin story than X-Men Origins Wolverine, which is hilarious. That it does the origin story better than the origin movie. I know that this is stereotypical, but another Spider-Man movie. I really liked Homecoming. I thought it was really funny. I thought it was really cool to see Batman playing the Vulture. That was nice. Uh, you know, there's some things that I would have probably done different with it, but Michael Keaton is a really menacing Vulture. It's really fun. Lots of humor. Tom Holland really plays it off really well. Uh, it's kind of weird to have Iron Man playing the role of a disapproving stepdad with <laughs> Spider-Man, but that's kind of how their relationship works early on. So, pretty good film. I liked it. And number one. All right, our number one movie on the list, Avengers Endgame. So, this is it. It's Maybe there's some recency bias that played into it. I don't know, but I'm okay with it either way. Endgame is a fantastic film. It's the the big conclusion to everything that has been going on, everything they've been building up to in the MCU. And uh, I got to say, they stuck the landing. I, I don't know that there's a better way to explain it. Uh, everybody was wondering, can it, can it really be as good as we're expecting it to be? And turns out, yeah, the answer is it is. My name is Iron Mantoya. You killed half the Avengers. Prepare to die. <laughs> Excellent movie. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the recency. It was obviously the action, but... I, I had, again, going back into it, looking at it without a comic book knowledge of how the movie was going to go, I was on edge the entire movie wondering what was going to happen, not knowing how Thanos was going to, you know, they kill him in the first, what, 10 minutes of the movie? He's dead. And then how, I was like, well. You know why he's what? dead? Thor went for the head. Yes, he went for the head. <laughs> but, like, you, you start with that. It's so 
big. And then you're like, well, how are they going to get everybody back? They have to get everybody back, which is actually one of the reasons I, I think I put it at number one on my list. But I hated losing half of the world in the last movie. I know that it had to happen for the story and everything. But again, not knowing it was going to happen and then seeing it happen, it made you long for wanting to see the resolution of of the entire series. And so I love that. I loved uh, how they put all the characters in there. Um, the, the intro scene was amazing with Hawkeye. That set the tone for the entire movie. For me, like you see that and you know that Hawkeye loved his family. And they're gone just like that. Like you, you're all of a sudden rooting for Hawkeye to go murder everybody at one point because it's just like holy cow, they took his family. But yeah, I just I I cannot like I've watched that movie probably 30, 40 times since it came out, and I can't find really anything to hate. Like usually you can pick out something that's oh it's just too boring here or didn't like the way the, they developed something. I couldn't really find anything about it. It just was a good movie, start to finish. Uh that almost made you cry at the end because of what happened with Captain America. But for those who haven't seen it, I won't say what happened. But that's my thoughts on it. Like just to kind of piggyback off of Andrew, on it, I I did cry at the end of it. I mean, it was it was twelve <laughs> years that it had been building for that. Like it was just it was awesome. Um, and then uh, the one thing I wanted to hit on of like I thought I think I mean I think it's a great movie. There's just like that one weird cringe scene where all of the women unite. Oh, that was awful. For yeah. no reason. Absolutely no reason. And it ruined the movie. All they had to do was like make them do like some big cool attack. And then I think it would have been justified. But gosh, that was so bad. Oh, I, I, like they just did it for no reason. Like, and it just that that wasn't the main thing that I took away from that movie out of this whole movie that was two plus hours long, there was this, that five second scene that I can't get over. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just, it was so stupid overall. Great movie. Um, Girl just, power, bro. But I, I, that's the I, thing. I, they had to check that. the box and that's why it's so cringeworthy is because you know, they only did that so they could have a, a girl power moment. But I'm 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 not even hating on that. It's just how they did it, you know. Sure. I'm, again, if it, if they had some weird, like if they turned into a Megazord or something, and then <laughs> and then one. Sure. Have you seen the Japanese version? Because I'm pretty sure that is what happens in that one. No <laughs> No It had no bearing because they all they're like girl power, and then they immediately split up. It's, right. It's like everybody get together and pose. Okay, break. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Freeze frame. So. <laughs> okay, I thought Scott was going to take this one from me. <laughs> Caleb, you hate on Iron Man so much. And I can't believe you don't draw this parallel. We talk so much about how Peter Parker develops as a character to develop this selflessness. Mm -hmm. Iron Man literally lays down, not only lays down his own life, but now that he's found actual fulfillment in his life, in a wife and a daughter, he still lays down his own life in order to, you know, save the day and everything, which is huge. You know, it was massive. He, he could have just left it. He wanted to leave it up to Steve Jobs and the gang. <laughs> but <laughs> eventually he's like, no, this is the greater good and only I can do this. So I have the responsibility to do it. Compare that version of Tony Stark to Iron Man 1 Tony Stark and look at all that character development over movie after movie after movie. And like, I feel like I have to take your criticism of him in Homecoming and count it as a plus. Like him acting as this stepfather figure to Peter Parker. I don't think he would have become the man who was so concerned about family if not for that influence of Peter Parker in his life. And I don't think that he would have made that ultimate sacrifice in the end if he had not become a father and concerned about his family, you know? And it, throughout, I, I wanted to mention this in the uh, honorable mentions, but I figured I'd save it for this. Throughout Iron Man 3, he was struggling with that same issue that Peter Parker's struggling with in the whole first part of uh, Spider-Man 2. 
and that's personal life versus being a hero. And he tries to have it all by automating everything, and that just doesn't work out. It's just spread over more movies, but you have the exact, almost the exact same kind of character development as Peter Parker, except Peter Parker starts as someone who's just weak. Iron Man starts from someone who's a jerk. You know, he starts from beyond the middle and into the negative and then goes all the way over to full-blown hero, you know? Okay, first of all, I do want to clear something up because based on your answer, I think something that I have said probably came off as misconstrued. I don't hate the uh, surrogate father version of Iron Man inherently because I think that it's bad. I hate it because it's very anti-Spider-Man. The thing that I dislike about it is that it keeps Spider-Man from being a self-made character like he is in the comics. Mm. And so I wasn't saying that I hate that as a story element. I don't hate it as a part of who Tony Stark is. I just hate the fact that Iron Man's basically always there to bail Spider-Man out when the Mm. whole point of Spider-Man's character is there is nobody to bail him out. He's got to figure it out on his own. Okay, that's a good point. So I I don't want people to think that I I hate that aspect of the Marvel Universe. I just think that it robs Spider-Man of one of his core character uh, traits from from the comics. But anyway. I think you just hate Tony Stark because he I don't Steve really Rogers. like Tony Stark, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But, but I didn't mean to give criticism where I thought criticism wasn't due. And I will say this, movie version of Tony Stark is significantly better than comic book Tony Stark. <laughs> uh, and, and to your point, since you went ahead and mentioned it, I'll go ahead and play off of it. One of the things I do appreciate about this movie is that it finally makes Tony Stark into the hero that we've been kind of wondering whether he was going to be for the past 15 years. Mm-hmm. And so he decides, even at the, the very first, when, when all this happens, he's like, you know what? I'm done with the hero thing. I'm fulfilled in my own life. I got what I wanted. Y'all can worry about all that. I'm good. And then he finally makes the decision. uh, Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm okay, but there's so many people that lost so much. I owe it to them to at least try. Well, even then it wasn't just about him. It was Mm -hmm. about his family. Well, that's like, no, I have a responsibility to my family now. Sure. And then, he comes full circle when he decides to make the ultimate sacrifice and, and reverse the snapping and, <laughs> uh, you know, take the, the iron or sorry, the iron gauntlet, the, uh, infinity gauntlet and take the stones from, from Thanos. And he decides to be the person that really we've been leading up to since Avengers one, where captain America said, you're not the guy that's going to make the sacrifice play. You're not the guy that lays on a tripwire to let his buddy step over him. Iron Man actually finally, weirdly enough, got one up on Captain America's like, no, I am that guy and yeah. and did it. And that was a great character development moment for him. I was fully expecting going into this movie that Captain America was going to be the guy that sacrificed it all. And Iron Man was going to be the guy that wound up to, to get to go home and live the happily ever after. Frankly, I was shocked when they reversed it. That... Iron Man is the one that makes the ultimate sacrifice and Captain America is the one that gets to have his happily ever after. That blew my mind. I did not see that coming. (laughs) Captain America got both. He got to be a hero for 90 years and then he got to be a family man for 90 years. He really did. It's an incredible transition there. Um, (laughs) I still don't understand how that works within their own understanding, like the the Marvel Universe's own rules of time travel. That doesn't make any sense, but it was a great send-off, so I'm going to let it slide. Before we, we conclude for the night, final thoughts uh, on, on the whole list. We'll, we'll start with Andrew this time. I think now that uh, I've, I've actually looked over all the Marvel movies, I think that top 10 doesn't do it justice. I think that there's a lot of movies that we really could have put up there that, you know, they, they were good in their own aspects, but the only reason they got beat out is because better movies came out. But at the time they were put out, they were like the epitome of their movies and their time. And so it's kind of unfair to rank some of the earlier, even some of the later X-Men movies and stuff like that 
up with like Avengers Endgame. So I that that's the only thing I would say about it because I there's a lot of great movies that we could have put up there and ten is just it's so hard you know to just keep it to ten. But uh, I enjoyed it. I think this was this is one of the the better ones that we've done. I'm looking forward to the other movie top tens that we do. <laughs> yeah, I guess just just thinking about like you know Andrew's talking about how the the comparison overall and. I'd, I think something that sticks out is that we really need a good Fantastic Four movie. It's something that's really missing. Thank um, you. But, but as far as this list wait, goes... Wait, wait, wait. There is a good Fantastic Four movie. It's called The Incredibles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a good series. Uh, or set of movies. But uh, I, I don't know. It's just interesting how our list span the entire you know, time of that, you know, we have uh problem. Well, you could say that really the first one or, you know, the third one, I guess, technically of that series of, of we had Spider-Man on the list. And then the second set of the first one with Iron Man. And then, you know, the, the last one of Endgame, all on that list. Um, it was just interesting to see how that was all represented. Um, and, and, you know, we missed probably a couple of them. You know, we had our honorable mentions that probably could have been on the list. Like, as, like if you're going by IMDb ratings, we definitely missed a couple, but we're not. It's our ratings, so. <laughs> <clears throat> well said. Yeah, no, it was, it was good. And honestly, like, after seeing the final list, I'd have to change some of my answers a little bit. Like, Avengers Endgame, I put much lower on the list than it ended up being. And after like going back and refreshing my memory on it, I'm like, oh wait, yeah, that was a better movie than I was I was thinking it was when I when I <laughs> compiled my own list. Um was a little bit disappointed that uh Guardians won out over Ragnarok. I thought Ragnarok had a slight edge over Guardians, but Same. not too mad about that. I was a little bit disappointed Logan didn't do better, but it turns out if Andrew had remembered Logan, maybe it would have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, <laughs> I thought Iron Man should have done a little bit more of a showing on the list. I thought I was I was surprised you that Thanks, I were Caleb. the only ones. <laughs> I was surprised that you and I were the only ones that put Spider Man on the list. I know, like, right? I was. I thought that between the two of us putting Spider-Man Two as number one, that would have solidified its position as number one. Turns out that just solidified its position in the top ten. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Right. Nobody put in only. Sorry, one person put Endgame as number one, but everybody else liked it so much there was enough of a community mm -hmm. of agreement that it wound up being number one anyway and scoring highest, and actually yeah. by a pretty wide margin. Which counts for something, you know, yeah, wide, wide appeal counts for something for sure. Right. Like you and I yeah. really loved Spider-Man. Scott hated it. And so <laughs> it wound up balancing out. It only ended up as number two. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, uh, overall on this list, I, I got to say, I didn't think it would be quite as hard to come up with a top 10 on my own without seeing your scores as I did. And man, there are just so many amazing Marvel movies. And then once I saw your list and combined it and I was looking at it, I was like, you know what? I can't be mad at the list. It didn't turn out the way that I would have put it. But we have such a collection of fantastic stories here. And you think about how much this has impacted society as a whole. I mean, an entire generation of kids have grown up on these stories and these movies. And I think that's the reason that it means so much to so many different people is that when it comes down to it, and we, we've said this a lot about some of the different individual movies and some of the characters in them. What this ultimately goes back to is that when people see stories like this, when they see actors bring these characters to life, they see themselves in it. They look at heroes like this, whether it's Iron Man or Spider-Man or whatever character they happen to relate to at the time, and they see somebody that doesn't have it figured all out that even though they may have amazing powers, whether they, they made their powers themselves like Iron Man did, whether it was given to them by somebody like Captain America, or whether it was a weird quirk of fate like Spider-Man, yeah, they have these amazing problems, but they've got problems just like everybody else. 
they may have all kinds of crazy powers that we kind of wish that we had, but even they have struggles and concerns and anxieties and things that they have to worry about. And watching somebody that's willing to put themselves aside and to do what's right because it's right, even though it may not be the easiest thing for them to do, that inspires us to do the same thing in our personal lives and the things that we're doing every single day. And that's why I think these stories mean so much to people. And the reason that when you're looking down the list of Marvel uh, franchises that got made into movies and which ones are the best, you have a really hard time picking them because at their core, even the ones that aren't that great do have that central theme. And that means something to us. I think that that really is the reason that this was a list that was so difficult to culminate and to put together. Uh, but it's the reason that so many of the entries and, and really all of the entries on the top 10, really, they tell that story. Well, guys, it has been an absolute pleasure. I've had a lot of fun. I know we've been going for a while, so I'll let you go. Appreciate y'all being on the call. We will be back next week on Friday with another edition of The Geek In. So tune in again at six o'clock to see that. In the meantime, stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalrada Church of Christ. Copyright 2020.